Pedro, Dr. Pedro Pedro, uh, from uh, European um, Journalism Training Association from Netherlands mm -hmm. and from Netherlands, Belgium. Belgium. Um, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here and, and your willingness to listen to me. And uh, we, in one hour there will be lunch. So, <laughs> my name is spelled like this. I mean, there is no document of destiny until now where the name is correct, but this is a correct version. <laughs> okay. In for many years, as you as you know, uh, Europe has been divided into two halves, and um, in the year 1989. The wall opened and a sort of optimism came across Europe. And that was the moment that a few universities in Europe, one in England, one in the Netherlands, one in France, about five or six, uh, thought it is important now to take this moment, this historical moment, to think about the future of journalism, which will become more internationalized as economics become more internationalized, politics become more internationalized, and so should journalism. So our young people should more than my generation had uh, learn about uh, traveling across Europe, thinking about Europe, uh, connecting with other countries, etc. So that was the idea behind uh, the European Journalism Training Association. We started with uh, six members and uh, in 1990 and now we're almost 30 years later and we have 70 universities, 70 members from uh, 30 European countries. As you can see, uh, we do not have a member in Poland at the moment, we used to have one. Um, but I think uh, before five o'clock this evening this problem will be <laughs> fixed. And we only have one uh, member in uh, Ukraine, and I'm, that is the uh, Mohila Ac Academy in National University in Kiev. You probably heard of it. Um, they are a member, and pr we're proud that they are a member. But of course, we would like all of you to become a member. And uh, you can look at our website, and you can ask me during lunch. But all of you qualif qualify for, for uh, membership. So um, there is a procedure, etc. But it's I'm sure you will all pass. Well, maybe one or two won't. Okay. The key word within um, uh, ESHTA is diversity, and that is what makes ESHTA such a wonderful organization, association. It's all voluntary work. My presidency also is voluntary. We only have one tiny staff member. She's on the secretariat in, in Mechelen near Brussels. Um, but our key word is diversity. Our, our members speak more than 20 languages. They have totally different histories and political backgrounds. Some of the countries are, you could say, rather rich. Others are not. Um, they have very different media systems. Some uh, are state controlled in, in the majority. Others are uh, uh, believers of the totally free market. And a lot of them are in between. Um, which is more or less yeah, the, 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 the thing that is usual in, in Europe, that you have the broadcaster being uh, public and the newspapers being private. So that is a strange di division if you look at it from a digital 21st century point of view, but that's how it grew in the, in the past century. We also have very different views on journalism, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, other traditions uh, in education, we have very different types of, uh, we have mid-career centers for those who are working in journalism or working somewhere else and want to become a journalist. Uh, but, but most of 90% of our members are, uh, are universities. Um, we have different uh, a types and ages of students, length of programs, education, I mean, you, you name it. The slide stopped here, so I couldn't go on. But, but mm -hmm. there are many, many differences. And we don't think that is a problem. We, we more or less celebrate that because we, we like the idea of diversity and be able to, to learn from each other. Although despite our uh, differences and the diversity, we managed to get one central mission statement. And 
uh, probably, I don't know, maybe you saw it already on our website, but I want to show it. Um, the most important thing is that we view journalism as a profession that serves the public. And that is not a common view across Europe. There are other views possible. But this is our view. We think journalism is there for the public, not for the market, not for the government, not for the state. It's there <coughs> for the public. And the public is our most important alliance. So our work must start with the public and end with the public. How do we do that? Well, in a million ways, but also by providing insight in, into all kinds of political, economic and sociocultural um, uh, issues and conditions, which also has ramifications consequences for the, for the curriculum, of course. We all want to stimulate and strengthen democracy at all levels, from the local to the international level. Um, we are very keen on, on holding people and institutions accountable and we want to help citizens to make choices in their lives. While at the same time feeling responsible for the freedom of expression, the integrity of the uh, individuals, being critical of sources independent of interests, and using standards, ethical standards. We can discuss this later, and I'll, 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 some of them I'll come back to, but this is important. This is not the only thing we share. We share this mission statement, and I think it was a huge step forward in the history of our organization when we, in 2006, finally managed to have this common mission statement. And everybody signed it. Everybody agreed with it. There are other things we have in common. We, have, we share uh, across Europe, if, whether we're from Finland or from Portugal, or from Italy or from Russia, we share the same type of dilemmas. And there are a lot of dilemmas, but uh, uh, I will mention four uh, of, of, of a larger list, but I think these four are important, uh, especially when you start discussing a new curriculum with your teachers, because what we often see is that all kinds of discussions are uh, on the level of how many hours for this, how many hours for that, but below that there are these kind of uh, dilemmas that very often are skipped, and that is a problem. You should always start by thinking together with your teachers, where do we stand? I'll, I'll show these some examples of this. The first is uh, the concept. Do we use a narrow definition of journalism or a broad definition of journalism? In other words, do we stick to, to, to journalism or do we say like, for instance, uh, Mark Deuze, maybe you know him, he wrote a lot about this, uh, journalists are becoming media workers and you should focus on media workers. That is a dilemma, and I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but you have to address this question. Where do we stand? And not me personal, but where does my team stand in this? What kind of expertise? It's another one. Are we focusing mostly, I mean most of the universities of course do both, but to sketch it a, a bit sharp, are we skill-based or are we focused on academic reflection? In other words, are we teaching our students to do journalism or to study journalism? And we see both. We see both, uh, uh, both of these situations across uh, Europe. The next one is where do we focus on? Do we focus on the news industry? Is that our aim? Or do we focus on society as a whole and maybe civil society uh, in special? To put it other, in other words, are we training for a specific job? Is that, is that our reason for existence? Or do we educate for a profession which takes more distance from the actual labor market? And the last of these four is uh, what, what is our mission? Are we realistic or are we a bit more idealistic? Are we focusing on journalism as it is actually developing, whether or not we like the development? For instance, in some countries, the developments are highly dominated by commercial incentives. You could, you could agree with that or not agree, but you can say, oh, okay, that's a given. So the actual development is in the direction of more commercial journalism. We will do that. Or do you take a more idealistic stand 
uh, and you say uh, we're focusing on journalism as we would wish it to develop. This is a more risky strategy because you take more distance from the news industry and from where the, uh, the jobs are at this moment. But on the other hand, you take the role of one of the parties that is important for the future of journalism. And not in the follower mode, like many schools have been for a very long time, following what the industry did, but more in an innovator mode. Maybe sometimes be ahead of what happens uh, in the field. I'm going a bit more into detail in, in, for this last, uh, in this last dilemma. If you're starting a uh, discussion about curricula, uh, we think, I think, um, that this is probably the first question you have to ask. Are we going to focus on journalism as it is or as it will be? Are we focusing on the current status quo, including what will happen this year, next year, and maybe in two years? Or are we looking at a longer time here horizon? Although nobody can uh, predict the future, um, you can say that one expected future might be a bit more probable than the other. And you can discuss with your teachers what do we expect in 10 or 15 years, or maybe even 40 years, because your students, when they uh, graduate, they have still 40, 45 years of uh, working to do. So it's not so bad to have a long-term view in this. But there is a third one, and that is, you could also say, we're focusing on, not on the, on the status quo, not on what we expect, but what we desire, the desired future, what journalism could be. You probably know the book of Barbie Zelizer with this title, What Journalism Could Be, and I would recommend it if you don't, because it's interesting to think in that way about journalism. We forgot that, more or less, in the 20th century. If I had to tell you where our schools are in general, I mean, as I said, there is a lot of difference and a lot of diversity. Some are here, some are there. But in general, I think the position would be about here, rather close to the status quo and uh, strongly on the line of the expected future, not so much on the desired future. Now, what we know and, and some of you talked about this uh, earlier in this uh, meeting, today and, and, and last week, is that the status quo is coming to an end. The status quo as we used to know it, especially the one from the 20th century, is fading away. And we're heading into a new situation. So the, the, there are not three options anymore. I think for journalism schools there are only two options, the expected or the desired future. Why is the status quo coming to an end? Uh, for a lot of reasons, but I will mention some of the major trends which count, I think, for all countries in Europe, including yours. There are f at least four fields where we can see important trends with some kind of ending. When we look at the technology, we see the ending of the monopoly of news. It's no secret for us that in the, over the past years many, many new news suppliers have entered the market. Many. And it's no secret for us that a lot of sources that used to be dependent on journalism now surpass journalism. That's what we call disintermediation. I mean, a, a famous example, or maybe famous is not the word, is uh, Donald Trump, of course, who does not use journalism anymore. He twitters directly. But a lot of politicians, political parties, companies, etc., are doing this. So uh, journalism is in all kinds of ways surpassed by, by its sources. On the economical front, we see the ending of the scarcity of news. Digitalization has made it so much easier to copy-paste news. So we used to have a monopoly. Um, we used to have scarcity of news. and. As you know from the economic uh, theory, when something is scarce, it, you, can pay, you have to pay a price for it. But it's not so scarce anymore, and this has disrupted our business model. Um, and news is uh, seen as free, I think, by us, 
but especially I do a lot of research among young people. I'm just waiting, yeah. Uh, a, a lot of research among young people, and, and they certainly see news as something that is free. They, they, they don't want to pay for it, but they find it no, not logical to pay for it. On the social field, we see the ending of mass audiences. In the 20th century, a lot of mass media uh, had to deal with mass audience, huge audiences. This is something of the past. I mean, there will certainly stay mass media for a huge public, but most of them uh, will turn into more smaller scale uh, groups like communities or specific target groups. And the last one I mentioned here, well, the last of the trends is the relational change, the ending of one-way sending. And this is very important because in the culture of journalism, and I'll come to that later too, uh, in the culture of journalism, this idea of sending has been very, very important. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't want to say, but I'll say it anyway. It's also because it has been for a long time a profession that had been dominated by males, and males like to send, they don't like to listen, as you know. These changes are part of a transition process, a huge transition po process, which says that we're leaving slowly the mass media model, again, a model that was highly successful in the 20th century, and uh, journalism uh, had, had its more or less golden age during the mass media model, and we're moving in what is called in the literature the network model. And it has structural features, but also cultural features. So the, the structural I, I just more or less mentioned. But there's more to it. There's also a cultural side, which is often overlooked. Um, the idea of the autonomous uh, journalist that works on his own, that does not cooperate with other people, that does not listen so much to the public, um, will change into a model of more cooperating with all kinds of parties. The idea of neutrality will change into an idea of m more commitment. Maybe not in every country as fast, and maybe not in every country in the same way, but these are more or less general trends. The idea that there is one objective truth uh, in science and philosophy, nobody thinks that anymore, of course. Uh, and certainly not after postmodernism. But in journalism, it seems that there is still, they think there is, like uh, with the Romans, one little village in France where there is a group of people, they, they are called journalists, and they have this potion, and when you drink it, you are the only one who can tell what is the truth, and nobody else can. That idea of the, the journalists own the truth um, is, is not so realistic anymore. Uh, we have to have, we have to be accurate, we have to be reliable, and we have to be transparent and show people how we do it, but not claim you can trust us because we are objective. And the final is immediacy, which still is important. It's still important if there's something happening to be as fast as, po as possible. But journalism evolved more or less into speed journalism, fast journalism, a bit too much. And the alternative is to, um, to, to put things more in perspective, to be more future-oriented. Maybe not so much look at the past, not at yesterday or today, but also look at the question, what's next, what now, what, what are we doing in, in the future? What we see within our members is that the structural change, the structural transition, is underway. It started. We're talking about uh, new media, and we're talking about new technology and social media, etc. Um, the cultural features, that discussion has only yet begun. And we see quite some differences within Europe. In, for instance, in the northern part of Europe, the Scandinavian countries, this discussion is further in its development than it is, for instance, in Spain or in Italy. We can talk about that maybe more. I have to... 
yeah, here I am again. Now, uh, I think it was Thursday that we talked about uh, not only asking our students, but also asking our alumni what they think of all kinds of things. And I wanted to point to a study Tom Rosenstiel did. I don't know if you know it, but uh, anyway, it is, it is interesting because he um, had a survey with more than 10,000 graduates from over 35 years from American schools. So they all graduated, but, but some of them had 35 years of experience, others had 25 or 10 years. But there was, this was a very interesting large group. And he asked them, what are the biggest problems for journalism? He asked them many questions, but, but I, I picked this one out. What are the biggest problems for journalism? And this is what they said. And if you have a closer look at them, uh, at the answers, you can say that there are roughly three groups of answers. The first problem has to do with internet and technology, as you can see. The second group has to do with economics, profit, selling, 24 hours news cycle, etc. And the third one has to do with quality. Although, like we, we are more or less used from uh, from, from journalists, just as from teachers and from other professions. They always think the problem of quality is not their problem, but it's the problem of the public. The public doesn't care about quality. Our definition of quality is yummy, but the, the public doesn't understand, or the media owners don't understand. It's not, not that we should maybe think of redefining what is quality. Now, if you look at the innovation debate, uh, the debate about innovations in journalism. Um, maybe you have the same experience as I have. The debate in journalism focuses very much on technology and economics, on what you could call the means that journalism needs. It's not so much about goals. It's about the means, the technological means. If there's a new gadget, we have to find out if we can do something with it. What's app? Snapchat, can we do very much focus on, on discussions about every new gadget. Um, and, that, and of course, a lot of talking about the financial part, um, business models, uh, targeting. At some schools, they started teaching marketing for journalists. At others, and many others, we have entrepreneurial journalism. Um, and I must say, I can understand that. I mean, the technological changes and the economic changes are so uh, huge and important, you have to think about them. Although I, th I think some of them are not primarily a discussion for schools, but more from the, for the industry themselves. Uh, but it's also good that, that, that we as schools have a look at that. But it is, it, it is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We have to do more as schools. And one thing we have to do, that is the third, uh, element from the Rosenstiel survey is that we have to redefine what we think is quality. We have to do that for the whole of the cycle of journalism. And, and if you make a simple uh, representation of that cycle, it starts with the public, then you start making things, that is the process. The process leads to a product with a form and a content. Then you distribute your products through platforms and through those platforms they get back to the public. And this cycle goes on and on. Now if we redo, redefine quality, we can put this, take these elements, public, process, product, twice and platform, all beginning with the P of Paul. Um, <laughs> I've been searching for a week to find words that start with a P. <laughs> and you can take keywords, and I think if we do an exercise, probably we get, we're about, let's say, 25, 50, 30 people, I don't know exactly. Um, we might get 10, 15 different keywords. Within our discussions until now, we also have a, a lot of variety. But I try to summarize it in order not to make it too complicated. When we look at the public, the keyword, um, I think, let's, let's say I think, is cooperation, making use of 
the questions of the public, the ideas they have, the content and the knowledge. More and more uh, uh, newspapers, more and more broadcasters, more and more journalists say, well, I know a lot about this subject, but probably, if I ask the public, they have a lot of information I would never have and I could never think about myself. So let's cooperate a little bit more, which is against, as I said earlier, which is more or less against traditional journalism culture because cooperation has not so, has for a long time not been so high on the agenda. If we look at the process, the key word is trust. It, in the it, earlier presentations, we've seen this word uh, also, and, and you know how important trust is. We have to guarantee reliability, transparency, and accountability. If we look at the product, the content of the product, the key word is depth. The fast journalism, the fast news, will be taken over anyway by aggregators, by amateurs, and by algorithms, three A's. But um, Rachel, yeah, I, 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 Achel, yeah, the A of Achel. So journalism has to re-shift again, like we had to do when the radio came, like we had to do when television came. And we have to do it again. We have to, again, think about what kind of things do we do? For, for young people, I must say, uh, news and journalism are two different things. It's not the same. It's not the same word. You could say uh, 50 years ago, newspaper was about, or journalism was about a newspaper. First, the paper part fell away because paper became digital, and now the news part is falling away because it's not so much news, news where we're talking about. Of course, we have to bring the news, but don't think you earn a penny with news. You will you, uh, uh, get the news, you'll get your income through the context, not by the news itself. The product form uh, will be storytelling, but in an other way than we used to do storytelling. So we have to learn our students far more to use words, images, graphics uh, in, a, in a creative way altogether. So I'm not so much fond of schools of journalism who have the organization according to the platforms, which is quite common still. You say we have a platform paper, we have a platform broadcasting, and we have a platform internet. That is not the future. That is not the way to organize a school. That is, that is the, 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 the end of the cycle where you start organizing the distribution platform. It is far better to look at types of journalism, investigative journalism, uh, for instance, and, and the branch community journalism, etc. We have students that are excellent storytellers, but not so good at, at investigating or at statistics, but they can write a hell of a story. You won't put, don't want to put them in one, uh, one, one stream in your school. And then we have the platform. Well, this is no news. Digitalization has, I mean, the, board, the, the, the borders we have between press and broadcast, for instance, have totally, are totally becoming blurred. And um, so the idea that one should be financed privately and the other publicly is also a, an idea from the past. It should probably turn around a bit and quality journalism should be financed by, by all of us and popular journalism should be financed by the market. It's another way of thinking that we have to leave this division into. So, now I come to our tattoo declaration. Because in our tattoo declaration, the, the, the schools that are member, and that is quite a lot, tried to develop a common vocabulary that was very important. If you want to exchange staff or if you want to exchange students, you have to know what you think you mean by certain words. What does it mean? What does a certain competence mean? So this was quite a discussion. And um, I'm looking back with a kind of satisfaction uh, that we managed to do that. Am, am I taking too long? No. no? Okay. I'll speak a, lit, a little bit faster otherwise. Yes, yeah, OK? OK. Uh, 
We develop 10 competencies, each of which contains a combination of five qualifications. So 10 times five is we have 50 qualifications. And I know that you can discuss for uh, 15 bath conferences in a row <laughs> about what you should uh, think that a qualification is. This is the definition we use. And it's, of course, you can, can do it otherwise. That was not our main problem. I mean, that's for other people to do. So here they are, the 50. <laughs> the good news is that, uh, well, you will be applying for membership anyway today, so uh, you will be on our website, and, and there they are, the 50. And it's no use going through them here and now, because it would take us too far, it would be too much. So I will focus only on the, on the competences that are one level higher than, than these qualifications. And these are the 10 competences. Um, why 10? Well, mainly because 10 is a more round figure. It could have been 11 or 8 or 254. I mean, but we thought 10, OK. We have the 10 commandments. And we thought, well, this is almost, almost the same. There are three groups of competences. It begins and it ends with reflection and renewal. We think that in a modern uh, school of journalism, uh, always starts with reflection on journalism's role in society. It sounds logical, but of all the handbooks I know, there is only one, and it's more or less outdated now, but it's only one that starts explicitly with journalism's role in society. Most handbooks of journalism start elsewhere, that you have these kind of uh, genres, and you have etc., 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 and that you have newspapers and, and radio, etc. They very rarely start with this. So we found it very important to state, it's a kind of statement, uh, everything starts with reflecting on journalism's role in society. This is not practical, this is intellectual, this is analytical, but it's necessary. And it ends with um, contributing to the renewal of the profession, because we think it's important. I mean, I have been in journalism education now for about 40 years. I started at five, you, you can understand. Um, and in the first 20 years, we had a rather simple job as a school of journalism. We just had to look at the very successful media industry, which was doing very well, translate it into um, skills and et cetera, et cetera, knowledge, and the job was done. But now the reference to the media industry is not that obvious anymore because the, the media industry itself is in trouble. So we have to teach our students to be far more critical on what happens in the media industry. They don't have to be, let, let's say, uh, uh, revolutionaries or something, but they have to look what happens in, in, in where does it go right and at what points does it go wrong. Why is it that journalism does not succeed in reaching, outreaching to young people? Why does journalism not uh, is able to outreach to uh, migrant groups? Why is most of their readership old people, white, most of them male, but at least white, uh, higher educated, uh, etc.? These are things that our students should think about. So this is the first group. Renewal and reflection. The second group is the famous production cycle of journalism. Find issues, organize your work, gather information, if it's possible, as swift as, as possible. Select information and present it. This is the famous, I mean, you, you know it. They have to do this, they have to learn this. I always say nobody of us wants to fly in an airplane where the pilot has only read the books and never had flying hours, never had any experience. So they have to, they have to do theoretical things, but they also have to do practical things. It's part of becoming a journalist. And then the third group, you could say, is the organizational context. 
account for your work within your organization, but also to external partners, cooperate in the team and act as an entrepreneurial journalist. We are in the habit of, uh, this one uh, came from 2013, it was built upon the one from 2006, and every seven years we update the competencies and the qualifications. So those of you who know mathematics very well know that the next year will be the next update because it's seven years after 2013. These 10 competencies uh, together <coughs> make what we call uh, the reflective practitioner and that is the word we use for our graduates. They have to be reflective practitioners. They have to know how to master the routines of journalism, but they also have to learn how to be critical and to research the routines and find out where do these routines work good and where is room for improvement. This all adds up to a, uh, a temple, which is called the Reflective Practitioner Temple. And it has four pillars, and I think those are, and you will recognize them, those are the pillars of, um, of journalism education. Journalism skills, as I said, very important. Some schools have 80% devoted to journalism skills. If you would ask me, you probably won't, but if you would do, I would say 25. I would say 25 for each of them. The second one is language skills, but it's not only words, it's not only your own language, it's also image language, it's also foreign languages, it's everything that has to do with the broad definition of language. The third pillar is general knowledge. You have to know as a journalist about uh, not only current affairs, but the, also the context of current affairs, which is about politics, economics, sociocultural developments, history. Those are essential subjects for students. And of course there are different models. You can say you study a bachelor in, in general knowledge and then have one or two years specifically for journalism. That is a possibility. Some of the schools have that model. Others have the model. We have a four-year or a five-year program and we have these pillars from day one. So all the time we combine the four of them. And the fourth one is research and reflection. Research not so much being investigative journalism but let's say more social science research into, for instance, the questions that I mentioned, why does this newspaper or this type of newspaper uh, does not succeed in reaching uh, young people anymore. And reflection is always combined with, with research. So I could go on, I have two more slides, but I think it is time, so maybe I should stop here. Is that okay? Or do you want to see the next two slides? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> well, just to show that uh, the dilemmas keep coming in every day. I mean, you open the window and there are four more dilemmas. And you go out the door and you let the door long, a bit too long opened and six more dilemmas come in. We did a research recently among more than 1,000 teachers of journalism across the 28 countries. And um, we asked them, where do you stand? Uh, in your view, so the question was, in my view, they had to say what in their view was. In my view, it would be good if journalism was more about responsibility, less about earning money more about ordinary people, less about ruling elites, etc., etc. And they had the usual five-point scale to answer, so they could say totally disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, totally agree. What I wanted to ask you, just for a few seconds, is if you could place a number after each of these. One is totally disagree, five is totally di uh, agree, so the higher, the more agreeing, agreement. Could you do that for me? For A to, to, to G? And then I'll show you the outcome of the teachers, I promise. Just now, just for a few seconds. And 
And what I at least want to ask you is, do you have a top three? Are there three of which you think, oh, well, I most agree with that one, and not second place that one? There are no good or bad answers. That is a comfort, probably. Okay, I will reveal now how the votes of the European jury was, which song has won. The thousand, more than thousand, almost 1,100 uh, journalism teachers across, the, across 28, not all of the 30 countries participated, uh, was this. The first one was more getting about the whole story and less about trying to be first. Here you can see the switch that teachers are making from fast journalism to slower forms of journalism, which I think is very important. And I don't have a stake in, in, in this, but when I saw this outcome, I was a little bit happy inside. The second one, more about social responsibility, less about earning money, is also not without meaning. I mean, it is an idea that, that journalism may have to shift away a little bit from the, the, the pure market. But again, this differs a lot. I mean, I could break this down, and I did that, but it's too far for now, into regions and into countries. And then you see that countries and regions of Europe uh, differ a lot uh, in these respects. And the third, and then I'll stop, is about more about long-term issues and less about the events of the day. And this is more or less the same expression that, that, that we probably m should move more into what is called slow, uh, slow forms of journalism. Okay, there's, there's a lot to say also about the, 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 the bottom three, but I'll stop here for time's sake. Uh, so thank you very much for listening.